So what I'd like to do in this video is just to go through this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which can be one of the more confusing things to understand when studying the TCA cycle. Uh, but it's fairly simple. The number one rule when understanding uh, physiological biochemical pathways is to follow the carbons and to follow the electrons. So let's try to do that. And we're going to start with pyruvate. We're going to end with acetyl-CoA, and we're going to see how the enzyme complex sets itself up to run the process again. So if you look at where my cursor is pointing on the screen there, pyruvate, it has three carbons. Three carbons. One of them, if you look here, well, we can see that this is just about ready to become a CO2. I want you to imagine that this negative charge comes down here, and then everything, these three, two oxygens and this carbon, all have an octet. This will be left with two electrons, which we'll need to do something with. So let's see what happens. The CO2 is released, leaving us with two carbons, and the carbon has some electrons. These electrons here will form a bond with TPP. So these electrons, this electron here that was binding to the carbon, will now bind to TPP. We have two carbons here, and we have the CO2 that's left. Now, we're thinking about making acetyl-CoA. So we should be thinking about what is acetyl-CoA. Well, when we think acetyl, we should be thinking two carbons. Well, here are two carbons, so let's see how we can get these two carbons incorporated into a molecule of acetyl-CoA. The next step here, demarcated by the two, involves the oxidized lipolysine, which means that this lipolysine is in a state where it's, it, it can be, it can accept hydrogens, basically, you know, reduction in the biochemical context is exception of hydrogens. So we're going to expect it to take on a hydrogen or some other thing that is going to uh, reduce its electron density a little bit. So what happens here is that one of the sulfur atoms accepts a hydrogen. So you can imagine that the atom, the electrons that were floating around the sulfur are now sort of extended and involved in sticking the hydrogen onto it. This other sulfur is going to have those electrons involved in bonding with the carbon. One electron, to be specific, involving with the carbon. So if you look here, uh, we broke this, so there's one electron here with the hydrogen, one electron is here, which means that TPP has kept an electron for some reason. Let's not think about that too much. Uh, but this has kept an electron. This is the important part, because now this electron that is on the acetyl group and this electron with the sulfur can form a bond, which is exactly what they do here. And here, this, uh, this light, this arm, this arm of the enzyme can swing over and interact with CoASH. Now, CoASH has a sulfur atom on the end. You know sulfur is very electronegative. It deals with electrons very well. So what it does is it attaches the sulfur to the carbon. And you can see that's exactly what happens here. We have our carbon, and the sulfur loses its hydrogen, and the sulfur attaches, giving us acetyl. We have two carbons, acetyl, CoA. The sulfur is bridging the acetyl group and the CoA, and that's exactly how co acetyl-CoA is made. Now, acetyl-CoA is going to go off and it's going to do a bunch of useful things, but let's focus here on how this enzyme complex is going to reset itself such that it can run the mechanism again. So the question might be, why can't it just run the mechanism again the way it is? Well, we see that in order to do this, we need a sulfide bridge between these two sulfurs, and what we have are two SH groups. So let's think, if we can get rid of these two hydrogens and one electron per hydrogen, then we'll have two free electrons, one on each sulfur, which can then form the bond that we were talking about earlier, the oxidized lipolysine. So, let's bring in FAD, 
FAD can accept two hydrogens because of its structure, and you'll see that in another part of the course if you haven't seen it already. But it can accept two hydrogens and one electron per hydrogen. So here's what happens. Each one of these hydrogens attaches to a molecule of FAD. Once that happens, the S bond reforms, and this is good to go. However, we need to regenerate the FAD so that it can help the enzyme reset during the next cycle. So let's see how that happens. Well, if we bring along an NAD+, we know that NAD+, can accept two electrons with one hydrogen. So what will happen is that we get the two electrons that are involved, one per hydrogen here, will go on to the NAD+, with one of the hydrogens. The spare hydrogen, well, we took away its electron, so it's just a proton. So the proton floats off, NADH floats off, and now the whole complex, including the FAD involved in the resetting mechanism, is good to go, and it's ready to have another turn and produce more acetyl-CoA. So I hope that we've been able to understand how pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA and where the carbons are, where the electrons are, and how the system overall cycles itself so that it can continue running and aiding the biological machinery.